This is the Verbatim Word Podcast, where we seek biblical truth in a daily context. I'm Justin Gary. Sometimes people look for signs, some sort of unexplained confirmation or encouragement, a sign that they are on the right path or have made the right decision, or a sign that somehow we have favor in the situation. It can be that signs are a real thing from God, the Lord sending us some sort of divine wink or nod, telling us that He is there or that He sees or that He is working. And what an encouragement when God does give a sign. As He gets the glory, our faith in Him is increased, and we press on in faith, concluding that the Lord has given us a green light in a sign that we are moving forward in grace. I know of someone recently who was offered a job out of the blue. They weren't really looking for a change, but it sort of landed in their lap. And they took the steps to head in that new direction, which can be kind of scary for any of us venturing out in faith. But they then saw the company they were going to work for has a Volkswagen van in some of their marketing. And this is an iconic image that personally they actually had meaning for them and significance. And they took that Volkswagen van as a sign, a confirmation. Now, I would not recommend making career and life moves solely upon seeing a Volkswagen van if you'd find that to be a sign. And so we need to be careful with claiming signs, of course. Biblically, signs were some supernatural wonder that the Lord himself did, showing up on the scene in some unexplained event. Not sure if the signs we claim at times are always legit, like if getting our order number at the fast food restaurant on game day and it happens to be our favorite quarterback's number means that the Lord has heard our prayers for our team to win the Super Bowl and has divinely arranged the outcome in our favor, that can be reading too much into signs. Signs can be wishful thinking. Signs can be reading too much into something. And signs by many are attributed to an impersonal deity or force somewhere out there, especially those who don't believe in the Lord. Saying things like, ooh, the universe has shown us a sign as if all their stars are aligning. But for those of us who follow the Lord, at times He can give us a wink and a nod with something that the world might write off as coincidence. The good thing is we do not need to look for signs or wait for signs. Signs may come if the Lord chooses to speak to us from time to time in those ways. But we don't bet the farm on signs, but consider them cautiously. At the same time, we serve a God who loves us perfectly, knows us intimately, and communicates personally, consistently with us. Throwing signs in the mix that speak our language or minister to us where and when we need it most is something that He has all the freedom to do. Those closest to Jesus were needing some kind of a sign right about now. They had been through the ringer the last few days, a betrayal, an arrest in the garden that sent them all scattering and into hiding an unfair trial that resulted in Jesus being condemned to death. The beatings, the cruelty, the insults, the abuse, the horrific criminal's death on the cross, and the hasty burial in a borrowed tomb. You can only imagine the confusion, the hopelessness, the despair of those dark two days between Friday's crucifixion and Sunday morning. With the Sabbath in effect, there was not much more to do than sit and reflect, and likely worry and wonder and fret and sorrow. This group of followers needs a sign, a sign to show them that they were not wrong about Jesus, that the last three years were not a waste of time, that their labor had not been in vain, that Jesus was the promised Messiah, and that God's plan would still prevail. And during those dark days after the resurrection, I imagine them praying, God, give us a sign. But as we head into the final chapter of Mark's gospel, we see that God does not just send a sign, no divine breadcrumbs or doggy biscuits to send them some light encouragement. What we see Mark 16, we see not a sign, but it's an appearing. Bigger and better than any sign the Lord could give from his throne in heaven, Jesus appeared to them, showing up on the scene. Breaking into their doubts and fears and disillusionment and darkness, Jesus appeared, resurrected, victorious, full of truth and promise and hope. It's something they were not necessarily looking for that Sunday after the crucifixion, but this was no ordinary run-of-the-mill Sunday. And signs would not do in communicating what Jesus had accomplished. It's something for which only an appearance would suffice. And signs are not enough to confirm the truth of the gospel that would go forth to save the world. But Jesus appeared as confirmation that what Jesus had set out to do on the cross, it was accomplished and the forgiveness for sins is complete. Paul writing in Romans 4.25 about Jesus, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. The fact that he appeared after his death proves that we have been justified. 
and our sins can be forgiven in what Jesus did for us. So Jesus appeared again, risen from the dead, something he would do for 40 days until his ascension back to heaven. He appeared to those who would take his gospel forward to reach us even now. Let's look at the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. We read in verses 1 and 2, Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. These women were watching the crucifixion from afar when we last looked at Mark 15. Their turn to step up and step in at this significant time in Jesus' work, when the other's disciples had fled and hidden in self-preservation. And Mark names them again, by name, to make sure we get just who was there. What they had seen and experienced on Friday was traumatic. And experiencing trauma can really paralyze people, keep them from moving forward, picking up again, showing up again. These ladies, though, do not head off and run to isolate themselves. They are dealing with hurt and pain and confusion, but they rise up and do what needs to be done, pressing through the pain, the confusion, the loss and trauma to serve how they can. There are times our emotions will want to get the best of us. We won't feel like doing certain things. We won't find motivation to do it. But when we can press through and press on to show up even when we do not feel like it, step in even when we don't necessarily desire to do it, but we do it because it is the right thing to do. We often find we have the motivation once we have begun or the strength or focus or ability that if we will show up, so will the Lord. We may not always feel like being at church or showing up to do ministry. We may not always feel like being a good husband or wife or parent or person even, but when we do, the Lord shows up and his power is perfected in our weakness something Paul told the Corinthians he himself had often experienced writing to them. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. We do not always feel motivated to fulfill our roles in life, but when we rise up to do what is right, God fills us as vessels to do what he would have us do. Paul also writing to the Corinthians, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. He says we're just clay pots, nothing special. But what's inside when God fills us, that's what's special. That's what's powerful. We do not always feel strength or passion or zeal to speak up or share out when it comes to our faith. But when we do show up, the Lord will fill us with his spirit and fill our mouths with his words because we went forward in faith even if we did not feel like it. And the excellence of the power is God's, not ours. And he gets the glory. Jesus promising in Acts 1.8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. I heard an illustration once, and it wasn't just an illustration, it was an actual story. I can't remember exactly who or what time of history or who the preacher was, but a famous preacher, he heard about a death, a significant death, just before going to preach. He'd been scheduled to preach at this meeting, at this revival, at this conference or something like this, and he heard about a death right before. It was someone very close to him. It would have been his wife or his spouse or his mother, something along those lines, someone very deep and personal to him. And yet he heard this news personally. He didn't share with the people who had invited him. He simply took it to heart, prayed for strength, got up, and he preached the sermon. He preached what he'd come to do because he realized that those people had come to hear about Jesus and not about his personal pain or his personal loss. He pressed through it. He ministered to people after even. He didn't rush off the stage at the end. And then when the night was done and he was finally alone again, that's when he released his emotions. That's when he allowed himself to begin mourning. Now, some people would say, oh, I couldn't do that. I could never do that. And this man probably couldn't as well. And I don't think he calls all of us to. There's times that we can call in sick. We can take the day off because we've just experienced a significant loss. But for this man, he felt the call of God to press on, that God's power would be perfected in that moment in his weakness. And there was a time to mourn and there was a time not to mourn. And he chose to delay that mourning just a little bit. But it wasn't his own strength or it wasn't his own power. It was the grace of God. Oh, there is much more power available to us than we can muster up. 
Oh, the Lord is faithful to come flooding in to equip us to do what he has called us to do. We are not limited by our own personal motivation or zeal or reserves. God gives us much more than we have available and stored up for ourselves. It is Sunday morning, and these women by nature may not feel motivation to do what they are called, but they don't shut down or crawl into a ball in the corner or flake out. Now when the Sabbath was passed, they bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. Up and at it early. Very early. The first day of the week, the sun had just risen. They could not have come sooner to do anything. The Sabbath the day before had prohibited it. And since sundown the evening before with the end of the Sabbath, the dark would prohibit them from doing anything productive. But now at first light, they go. I like this principle too. Often when we are down and depressed, lacking motivation, we sleep it off. We sleep in, we avoid starting the day. In my own bouts of depression, someone shared with me once that getting up early and consistently can actually be a part of kickstarting the brain, the body, the mind. And I took that to heart, would not let myself sleep in too late very often. But I'd set an alarm, even if the day was not too full, to get up, to get out, to set a routine, and boy, did it help. Harvard Medical School wrote about a study published in May 2021 by a research group. The results suggested people who regularly wake up an hour earlier than usual without sleeping less may be able to reduce their risk of major depression. Researchers looked at data from about 840,000 people and broke it down to figure out those who were early and later risers and correlated it with those who had been diagnosed with a major depressive disorder. They found that those who were genetically predisposed to getting up one hour earlier in the morning compared with later risers had a 23% lower risk of depression. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, and we do find correlations between body, mind, and spirit. And research shows that getting up earlier might kickstart us a bit. And these women, as, they, as, as down as they might be after losing all hope with Jesus' death, they're at the tomb at first light still serving Jesus, even in their loss. And it could be on those darkest nights where we think we don't even want to get up tomorrow, we don't even want to set an alarm, that those are the perfect times to make ourselves get up just a little bit earlier to go meet with Jesus, to seek Jesus before anyone else stirs, to go out to the garden, to go to expect to meet with him. That might be something that we could wisely do to ourselves, even if we don't feel like it. Now, these ladies know their work is not done. They had watched from afar, but now it is their turn, and they come to anoint him. They purchased spices, not to mummify the body, but to anoint it, something they did in the decaying process of the body, to keep the smell at bay. They come when the sun had just appeared. It had risen, appearing up over the horizon, such a powerful testimony of God's faithfulness, the appearing of the sun each day. It comes again and again, a new day dawning every 24 hours. It's an automatic reset, a do-over, a chance to start fresh. Yesterday may not have been a winner, but today we get to try again. Jeremiah and the nation were going through the thick of it. Judgment had befallen them, and they were disillusioned and utterly hopeless. And in Lamentations, he wrote about how the sun's appearance each day was a reminder of something key that he could cling to. He writes, Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God did not burn us up at the end of the day before, sending judgment to consume us completely at the end of yesterday when he took into account our successes, our failures, our mess-ups. His compassion endures, and it's new every morning. Today, with the appearing of the sun, we see his faithfulness once again, a great reset in our lives, a clean slate. This is why I find it important to meet with the Lord first thing in the morning, not a hard, fast, legalistic law, but to draw near at the start of a new day. It's a new beginning every 24 hours when the sun appears. For these women, the day has dawned, and with the flooding of the earth with sunlight, the light made things appear more clearly. They waited for the sun to make their intended work of anointing the body easier, versus stumbling around in the dark trying to do it by lamplight. I upgraded to a newer phone within the last year. I had had held out for a long time. My old phone just wasn't cutting it anymore. It was a simple smartphone. It did the basics, but had no memory whatsoever. I had just a few apps. And even then I'd have to constantly delete things to get the apps to run. 
no room to add pictures, and I had just a handful on there. My coworkers always teased me about my phone when I pulled it out. It was a small, it was very light. They joked that it was basically the size of a credit card, which I loved about it. But I finally got a new phone, and I admit it has been actually pretty great. Not just because my coworkers have started leaving me alone and taking me more seriously, but because I can do a lot more with this phone and don't always need to worry about space and memory that it does or does not have. But one of the coolest things about my phone I like, and I'm a simple person, is the flashlight function. And I can turn it on simply by tapping the phone twice in the air and it comes on. My old little credit card phone, well, it had a flashlight function, but you had to open up all these apps and go to this certain settings button and then pull something else down to be able to turn that uh, flashlight on. This one's much simpler. I tap it twice in the air and the flashlight comes on. It's not exactly the convenient for a quick need for a light on my old phone, but this is convenient. Just flick my wrist and the flashlight comes on. And, and while I'd let there be light, I use this thing all the time. Getting up in the morning, the house still dark, trying to let my wife sleep since we have different start times to our day. I use the light to walk me through the house safely into the other rooms where I will turn on the light. Or on my way to the gym, it's a block away and I walk there in the morning darkness. I use the flashlight on my phone as I head that way, especially in the winter to make sure I'm not slipping on ice or crossing paths with any, with any possums or skunks or other nocturnal creatures that I'd rather not meet first thing in the morning before dawn's early light. But walking or moving in the dark, it can be a dangerous thing. We stumble and fumble much easier when we try to get around in darkness. And that's how life can feel at times when we're distant from God or losing sight of Him in the midst of our circumstances, when we, quote, feel like we are in the dark. We can find ourselves stumbling in the dark for answers and directions. Feeling around for answers or direction and being in the dark can be frustrating and futile. Something that the psalmist felt in Psalm 130 and equated to stumbling in the darkness. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I do hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. The psalmist expressing this longing and expectation for the Lord to shed light on life and all the questions and situations we're trying to navigate through, feeling like we're in the dark. And sometimes those dark seasons can go on for a long time. And we look for hope in his word more than those who watch for the morning. On the island of Maui, where I grew up, is Haleakala National Park. It's a dormant volcano, some 10,000 feet to the summit, and it's known for amazing sunrises, a must-see for many visitors, visitor, visitors to the island. And people set their alarms for the middle of the night, get up at unmentionable hours, leave their hotels and tour vans, pile into their rental cars in the darkest hours, get the kids in the pickup while still sleeping in the jammies, and drive up the, the winding road to the summit of the crater, dark, pitch black, and then they get there and they wait. People from all over the world, each and every day, they position themselves to watch for the morning, to see the sun slowly rise on the horizon in all its glory and beauty and its colors and splendors, the chance to see a new day dawning, a fresh start, a new day with new possibilities, watching that horizon. These women come to the tomb that morning with all the darkness and heaviness and confusion of the previous days. They come in faith, their devotion to the Lord not yet finished. And when the sun appears, the light reveals that things are not done yet. And the darkness of the previous days is swept away in something so much better. We read in verses 3 and 4, And they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. Gotta love the faith of these women, or maybe their lack of planning ahead. They have this plan to go and anoint the body. They have bought the spices, set their alarms an hour early, using the flashlights on their phones to get there ready until to head out soon as the sun breaches the horizon. But it's like they forgot one small detail. Who will roll the stone away? Like they had not thought about it, considered it. It's a big oversight. Now, I won't make some sexist comment about the practical planning abilities of this group of women, but I do find it amusing that the disciples are not there at the tomb. They likely wrote off any possibility of accessing the body. The stone rolled, the Roman seal of the stone, the guards that were stationed there at the tomb, all those things would have kept those analyzing the situation away. But these women go in faith, or perhaps because they're a little naive. There's a gift of faith that some have more than others. 
Paul writes about it in 1 Corinthians 12 when expounding on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And whether that be a regular gift that someone operates in, where they just might always seem to have a bigger measure of faith to believe, to believe God, to move forward, to take steps when some of the rest of us might talk ourselves out of it. Or in special occasions, the Lord gives you faith to believe and to move forward even though the circumstances might seem overwhelming or impossible. You just believe God can and will do it, so you step ahead. Having faith is a key thing in following Jesus. We're told in Hebrews that it pleases God, and without it, it is impossible to please Him. I mentioned that this summer the church I pastored in Slovenia is celebrating 20 years since it was registered with the government there, a big step and milestone in the process of the life of that church. But the church's story stretches back about a decade before that, too, with the early stages. And I remember a ton of key moments of faith. But one was during my senior year of college. My mom had been on a mission trip to Slovenia about six years prior. And in the summers that followed, we as a family had invested in that ministry and those people, returning yearly to encourage and pray that the Lord would raise up a church there. And she said, one time she came back, she said, it's time. This summer when we go, I think we're supposed to start a church. And the first question out of my mouth was, but we don't even have a pastor. Who's going to pastor it? And she said, I don't know, but it's just time to go and do it. This gift of faith, not having all the answers, not talking us out of it based upon the practicalities of the situation. So we moved forward, believing and trusting God to do what we could not. And that summer, we did start a Bible study. Still, we didn't even have a pastor. And it would take another year or so until I realized that I was actually the one God was calling to pastor that church in that first season. But the gift of faith not to be limited by the impossibilities, but to move forward with what God wanted to do. That's something that we can ask for. Lord, give me a greater measure of faith. Lord, give me the gift of faith. And it may not be your permanent gift, the one that you operate in all the time. But even in certain times or certain situations or certain things that you're facing, Lord, give me the faith to trust you in this. And he can give you that gift. And the women went to the tomb, not thinking it through fully. Only when the plan was already unfolding, did they seem to ask the also important question of, uh, who rolled the stone away for us? But they just showed up and the Lord had arranged for it already. They appeared on the scene and see that God had made all the preparations. Walking with God, we sometimes feel that like we just make an appearance, like the celebrity who just shows up for the quick photo op. The crew has made it all come together. They walk on the scene, snap a few pictures, and then they head back to the trailer to touch up their makeup. How often we just make an appearance, but it is God who has made all the arrangements, comes before us to set the stage, remains after to do the follow-up and the cleanup if necessary. We just sort of make an appearance. That seems to be what the women did that morning. And we see in verses 5 through 8, And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him, as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, and for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Did you pick up on a few things there? They were alarmed. They were alarmed. They trembled. They were amazed. They fled. They were afraid. Some high emotions in gear at this point. The angel appears to them there, and they were alarmed, it tells us. Ever been spooked when you see someone where you're not expecting? You think you are alone in the office and turn the corner and see someone in the mailroom, or at home and didn't realize someone was there in the room as well. And when you realize it, geez, you scared me. I didn't see you there. The ladies are at the tomb, early morning light, still some shadows, a dark tomb, and tombs can be creepy, no doubt. And this young man, this angel appears there. They didn't expect to see him. A messenger to clarify the message. Do not be alarmed, he said. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? That probably would not have been their first conclusion. The Heavenly Father did not leave this to a, oh, they'll figure it out sort of thing. This message and the understanding of what took place there in the tomb was too important to leave ambiguous. So an angel is dispatched to wait for the women to explain the situation. They are alarmed. Not sure if you've ever seen an angel, but probably pretty unsettling at first to see something supernatural, not of this world. There is a spiritual realm, and we do not get to see it with our human eyes. We don't see all that's going on, but there is a spiritual realm. 
God is working behind the scenes, and there are powers and messengers and opponents, a whole world going on that we cannot see with our eyes. There are times that the veil between two realms is more transparent, where God allows spiritual beings to appear to us so we might see what is going on. I think most of us will never see or experience that, but there are times where it appears. I think of Billy Graham's book about angels, all these testimonies and stories about what angels are and who they are, and, and even appearings that people have seen angels even in this midst and been unaware of it until later, where the spiritual realm appears and we can see it. Elisha's servant was freaking out in 2 Kings. The armies of the enemy had surrounded them, and they appeared outnumbered. And we read, And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And so he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. The spiritual reality of this situation appeared to them, and they understood what was, going, what was going on and what God was doing. How emboldened, how empowered, how equipped and prepared. We won't always have the curtain pulled back to view what is taking place around us, but we just might get the reminder or encouragement that there is much more than we can see taking place. And God is on a throne that is higher over everything and above over everything, seen and unseen. So what was the message of the angel? That Jesus would appear to them in Galilee. What good news this would be. They were down and depressed, but Jesus would appear again. They would see him once more. Oh, what joy and comfort this would have been. How many who have lost someone they loved express what they would give for just one more day with them, one more opportunity, one more conversation. And these women are told that he is alive, that he will appear before them once more, and that they should pass that word on to the disciples and Peter. I think that this is an extra, extra exclamation point on this. Make sure that Peter knows, the one who said that he would stay faithful even if all the others betrayed. But he didn't make it, and the rooster crowed, and he wept bitterly. But this extra message, make sure Peter knows that he's included too, that he's been forgiven, and Jesus wants to restore him. Not disqualified, not written off. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you into Galilee. There you will see him, as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. He's going to appear to you, so get ready. They trembled, they were amazed, they were afraid, and it said that they said nothing to anyone. Now we know that they did report the resurrection. We'll see that in the next verses. Verse 11 says the disciples did not believe them. And Luke 24, 9 says that they told the disciples, but not telling implies that they likely left the scene of the empty tomb and did not discuss it further amongst themselves or amongst anyone else. They didn't try to figure it out or get their story straight or try to talk themselves out of what they'd just seen or make a pact never to tell a soul and this will stay just between us. They could not deny it. So they went to make a report to the disciples as the angel urged them to do. And this is when the ball gets rolling. Jesus begins appearing. These glimpses of the risen Lord, sporadic and strategic, peppered throughout the day and amongst the contingency of followers. First, we see he appeared to Mary Magdalene, verses 9 through 11. Now, when he rose on early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, and out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. He appears to Mary as the resurrected Lord. But the appearance that day, it was not the first time they'd appeared with impact in her life. We're told that he had previously cast out seven demons from her. No backstory about how she came to be possessed with them, but they ruled her, controlled her, manipulated her, used her, abused her. It was Jesus of Nazareth who set her free during his earthly ministry. This woman had been robbed of who knows how much life, but Jesus appeared and she became a free woman. He had power over darkness, and he showed it faithfully to her, and her life became a testimony of his delivering power. Oh, the testimonies of those who have been set free, when Jesus appeared to us right where we were, found us where we were, and delivered us from all the sin and bondage that we were trapped in. Many people claim to know about Jesus, especially in our Western society like America. They can name drop Jesus. They can theology talk Jesus. But those who are born again have experienced the saving power of Jesus. He has appeared to them off the pages of the Sunday school storybooks. He's appeared to them more real than a Sunday sermon from a pulpit. 
He has shown up and appeared in their darkest hour, their time of need. And when Jesus appears, they were not the same. Mary Magdalene, as all the redeemed of the Lord, has been set free on Jesus, and she followed him and served him, a disciple of his. She knew in practice what Paul would later write about it to the Corinthians. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have not, who you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which is God's. Mary Magdalene knew that Jesus had bought her back from the grasp of the enemy. And all that she had served in her life with during those dark times, Jesus appeared, and now she was his servant. Something Paul would echo too to the Romans. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. That's the new, the new life that she was given over to, to serve Jesus in what was right and what would bring him glory. And it's to her, to whom he had already appeared in power in her darkest time, he appears first to her, now the resurrected Christ. It was the same Jesus, but he was different too. As Don Stewart said in his commentary, Jesus' body was similar to his pre-resurrected body, but some aspects were different. He could suddenly appear and disappear. In the locked up room, Jesus suddenly appeared in the midst of his disciples. His new body had abilities the previous one either did not have or did not demonstrate. He did not have to eat or rest. He also ascended into heaven when his earthly ministry was finished. Consequently, there are similarities as well as differences between the body that Jesus had while upon earth and the one in which he was raised. But Mary saw Jesus resurrected. And if he set her free previously from the demons, seeing the reality of the resurrected Lord changed things even more, not just for her and the church, but for all who would place their trust in him. The resurrected Lord changes us. There's a living dynamic to our faith in Christianity. It's not a rule book to begrudgingly follow. It's not a religious code that we must adhere to. It's not an old tradition to keep plodding along with. But Jesus' resurrection makes it a living relationship that we abide in because he is alive. He's not dead, but alive. And what this means for the believer that we serve a true and living God, if we can just remember that and grasp it and live in the reality of it, it changes everything. We serve a living Savior. Paul and Barnabas were grieved when the people of Lystra sacrificed to them, thinking that they were deities manifested. And they said, men, why are you doing these things? We are also men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things, these idols, to the living God, the one who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all the things that are in them. How invigorating to remember that Jesus is alive. Mary Magdalene was the first to see him, but not the last. And though he may not have appeared to you or I in a resurrected body form at any point, the disciples of Jesus who knows that he is alive with a different focus, a different purpose, a different life of trust and faith and peace, that can be ours. We know that Jesus is alive because of his continued work in our lives and, and those around us. Contrast that with those to whom he has not appeared. And yet in this passage here, when we're reading the gospel of Mark, the followers of Jesus, the disciples, they mourned, they hid. No life yet of their own. Though he was alive, they were not a lively bunch. They were not experiencing that resurrected life yet because he had not appeared to them in this way. Oh, that is the prayer for many around us, isn't it? Even for fellow believers, for those we love, for family, for friends, that they too would encounter the resurrected Jesus, that Jesus would appear to them in a real and powerful way to come off the pages of scripture and come to burn in their hearts. How powerful it is to see him alive to make us come alive. And of course, the resurrected Jesus means that the resurrection is ours to share. Jesus resurrected means that we can be too. Paul told the Colossians, and he, Jesus, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. And later to the Corinthians, but now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, that is, those who had already died who were believers. Jesus back from the dead meant that we can be too. We can come back from the dead. There are other, others in scriptures previously who had been revived from the dead, but not resurrected. Jesus was the first. And in him, all who die in Christ will be found resurrected in Christ. What a glorious hope for the believer that we shall never perish, but have everlasting life. And it's not an empty promise by any means. Mm. 
Though Mary Magdalene told them that he appeared to her, the disciples could not live off of Jesus' appearing to her. They had to have their own resurrection experience. Just like we cannot live off of the resurrected encounters of any others, we must experience it ourselves. So Jesus keeps showing up. Mark 16, verses 12 through 14. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, and they did not believe them either. Later, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table. And he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. He appears to two on the road to Emmaus as they walked there that day. Such a cool account in Luke 24. Read it if it's been a while. They return and share what they had seen. As must we all who have experienced the resurrected Jesus, we have to talk about it. It's too good of news to not speak about it to others. But even the disciples do not believe them. Just no kickstarting these guys. They need their own appearing. It says, Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and their hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. It happened later better late than never, but what a miserable time it was in in the interim. How often we don't live in the reality of a resurrected Jesus. We live today in our circumstances as if he is not alive. That's what they did that Sunday, all day. The disciples pouting, moping, hiding, ineffective. And all day long since the sun rose, he's been appearing, walking around, talking to people. But they hid in the shadows in vain because of their hardness of heart and unbelief. I remember a kid at youth camp one year, totally introverted, not wanting to be there. Arms crossed, not talking to anyone. Parents had made him go, and he did not want to be there. Granted, he had had a hard life, lost his mom tragically, a lot of wounds and hurt, and all the baggage that came with him to camp. As the weekend went on, the Lord was moving in many of the youth, but not him, it seemed. The sermons were awesome, kids were responding, but not not him, it, it appeared. Back row, arms crossed, head down much of the time. Worship, not budging. Even as those songs sang around him, those people around him were singing passionately. And then I remember that kid, the last night, the last few songs, you know the ones they play after the final sermon is preached when everyone's kind of pumped there at camp? Something switched and Jesus met him. And this kid, I remember, he came alive. Like he was smiling, he was singing, arms no longer crossed. He was still in the back row, but now he was actually standing on the chairs in worship along with those who were around him who were doing the same. And no one made them get down because they were worshiping Jesus passionately, enthusiastically. It was pretty cool. I remember seeing it, a real transformation. But I remember thinking as well, bummer. It took that kid the whole weekend to let down his guard. And only the last worship set did he finally let Jesus touch his heart and respond to what Jesus has been trying to do all weekend. That's the disciples that first Sunday. It's the kid at youth camp. Arms crossed, scowl on their faces, not getting out to experience Jesus. He had appeared, just not to them. Oh, how many of us need to get out of the room, get out of the cages of life or circumstances or the season or our thoughts or our emotional paralysis and go find Jesus and see him. He has appeared, but maybe not to us. Where were these people? They were in a locked room. And in his resurrected body, Jesus didn't wait for them to open the doors. He appeared to them even there. He just walked through the walls. Jesus can meet us anywhere. The dungeons that we've trapped ourselves in, the pits that we have fallen in, the locked up hearts that we hide in, the cells that we have chosen to be in, the hiding that we have retreated to, the fear and the anxiety that we are chained in. Jesus can appear even there. He's done it before and he will do it again. Lord, we praise you for the resurrection, that you, Jesus, are the resurrection and the life. Thank you that our faith is sure and that our faith is secure proven to us because the grave is empty. No doubting or wondering. And Lord, appear to us where we need it most. Bring resurrection power where it is crucial for us to have. And forgive us for our hardness of heart and unbelief that keep you locked out of the areas that you have every right to bring life to, your life to. Lord, as Titus wrote in his epistle, there is one appearing that we look for most of all in this time and this season. We look for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask that you would appear once more. Our eyes are on the horizon to watch for your return, and it's with that hope that we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.